Welcome to another of our Wednesday yachting luncheons. It couldn't be prettier out there. We're going to say it's five knots of breeze in the middle of the bay, like maybe six-ish out there in the gate. If you're not here, you wished you were. Let's see a little bit about future speakers. Uh, you want to come by in December. We'll have the traditional father-son Christmas luncheon with, uh, uh, you know, chanty singers, uh, the Sots, the San Francisco Boys Chorus, not tying contests, all the usual stuff. It's always a sellout. You want to come by and make a reservation early. Um, uh, earlier in December, Gary Jobson will be here on the 12th to talk all about the state of sailing worldwide. Those who've talked about the decrease in number of sailors should talk to Gary because he'll talk about the different kinds of ways people are getting on the water from windsurfing to all kite kiting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in November, come by here, Mikhail Vinikov. Mikhail Vinikov was an army ranger, and we got out of the ranger. He had a hard time converting to civilian life, and so, of course, he started a foundation on the transition from military to a civilian life, and it's a great foundation. They do really good work and challenging their vets, so I want to come by and listen to his story. Lee Bruna will be here in November to talk all about misfits, Merchants and Mayhem, The Tales of the San Francisco Waterfront. He's a great, written several books. He's a really fascinating author. Bob Heller will be by in the end of, in the middle of November, um, on the 14th, to talk all about um, trade, tariffs, and Trump, what is good for America. So uh, we couldn't have a more informed speaker. As a former governor of the Federal Reserve Board, he's paid attention to monetary policy for decades author of multiple books, including textbooks on the subject, so he'll be uh, an informative um, speaker. And next week, Gina Barty will be here to talk all about the treasures in the stacks of the uh, Maritime Academy, or the Maritime Library over at Aquatic Park. And she'll show many pieces that are have never been seen before, so there'll be rare view of, of uh, their research um, goodies from their stacks. A little bit about our speaker today. Imagine being five years old and you're racing across the bay, returning to your port over in San Francisco Yacht Club with your dad, sitting to Lourdes, sailing your Columbia 40, and you're thinking to yourself, why is the boat going so fast? We're going across the wind. We're not going down the breeze. At seven years old, our speaker today got his El Toro and realized, holy cow, I don't know my knots. I wonder if I'm going to get my El Toro rating from those who remember him, Hilly Stong, who ran a great junior sailing program at SFYC for years. At 12 years old, our speaker got a laser from the one and only Don Trask, started sailing his laser to good results right off the bat, sailed in the Nationals in Alamitas Bay, and surely when you watch this, you'll remember driving south on Highway 5, the brand new Highway 5, to take your boy sailing down there to Alamitas Bay. Um, in 76, our speaker sailed in the Olympic trials, still just a youngster, took like 13th or something like that, can't tell exactly how well he did, he just remembers being 13 years of age and sailing in Lake Ontario, what a big deal there. And those same trials, a guest here today, Randy Heck, took second in the Olympic trials to none other than Dennis the Man Connor, who would go on to win a bronze medal in the Olympics too. Give us a wave, Randy, holy cow. <laughs> Um, in, uh, at 18 years of age, our speaker would win in 1980 the U.S. Youth Champs and put himself on the map for sure. Uh, 60 boats, Port Townsend in laser. Russ was beginning to feel kind of a home at these fast, you know, physical kind of boats. Uh, in 81, he got himself a fin, started thinking about sailing the fin more, raced over in Kiel. In uh, 83, did well enough to decide he would go get himself a new fin and spent a day with Buddy Melgus, came out here with his new fin, started racing around. We met in 83, and Russ was incredibly thoughtful, smart kid for, you know, just being a youngster in the sailing world. But more than that, he had an incredible passion for racing. We made a list of all the things that people were good at. You know, uh, Healy was really great at tacking, et cetera, et cetera. Russ, we'd made all kinds of videos of Russ. So in the Olympic trials in 84, um, uh, he would basically race to incredible results and honor our club almost going off to the Olympics, uh, which takes us to um, uh, 
him joining the St. Francis Yacht Club in 1977. Now, we have a lot of historic activities at our Yacht Club, and one of them is we elect a Commodore every year. And so we would like to introduce our Commodore this year, the first female Commodore in the history of the St. Francis Yacht Club, Teresa Brandner. Teresa. Thank you, Ron. Uh, and a uh, couple things. Uh, welcome, welcome, members and guests, those of you here in person and those of you viewing online. I spoke with somebody as I was walking in the door who's watching on their phone today. So um, say hello to Dave Wired. But um, anyway, so I have a question. I know Russ, I've raced with Russ. Do you remember that? A couple times. How many of us has, have raced with Russ? Yeah, quite a few. Well, he's raced twice with me on my J105. Once, I think, it was because he lost a bet. <laughs> the other one was <laughs> the other one was a Masters Regatta, way back when. Anyway, so, um, no, anyway, um, also, I know Russ very well this year. Um, I've worked with him a lot because he's the chair of our challenge committee, and that's the subcommittee of ERC, and that's what we're here to talk about a little bit today. But he's done a phenomenal job, and we have a um, fair amount of trophies in our front case, and so we owe Russ a great... A huge thank you for that. So anyway, looking forward to um, hearing some more details, Russ. And also, um, it's always a pleasure. And thank you so much for all the volunteer work you do for this club, as well as the, the amazing sailing that you do. So you ask yourself, what makes a club great? I would submit that great members who contribute to and succeed on behalf of the club. Our speaker today has won a Mallory Cup. He uh, was elected or named Olympic Athlete of the Year in the Sydney Olympics, uh, where he competed in the Finn class. And in 2015, he founded the Challenge uh, Committee. This is an incredibly uh, thoughtful uh, endeavor by the club. Russ goes out and finds other club activities, racing against other yacht clubs around the country, and puts a together teams to compete on behalf of the St. Francis Yacht Club. And since he took over this committee, the club has uh, had incredible success. There's a lot to this. We want to ask many questions about his methodology, but one thing is for certain, it would not be nearly as successful were it not for the incredible, thoughtful, and productive energy that our speaker today has put into the challenge committee and our Yacht Club. Our speaker today, Russ Silvestri. Wow. <clears throat> wow, that was a very, very kind introduction, and uh, it really makes all the work uh, that goes into putting the phone calls and the emails and everything else uh, together to get, go and produce great results for the club. It makes it really feel worthwhile. So, Teresa, thank you for those kind words, and it, it really hits me. And, and Ron, thank you for so many years of friendship. Um, I do have to acknowledge one person who, who's not here, who I've seen sit in that table before, and I see that Peter Saws passed away. And... Um, I really enjoyed him, and uh, he had a great spirit and ran a lot of races for the club, and uh, he'll definitely be missed. So, huh. anyway, uh, let's talk about the challenge committee and, and what we're up to, and um, it's particularly about 2018 and where we're going forward and, and really why we do this. And there's one other person who's here today I really want to call out, and that's Bruce and Debbie Smith. Um, they've been incredibly generous in making a lot of things happen. And it's a vision that, that Bruce has shared and Debbie has shared <clears throat> that's, that's allowed us to do a lot of things and um, feel lucky to have you on our team. So thank you, Bruce and Debbie. So let's get into it. Um, whoops, let's go back one. So here, here is uh, this year, I would say, is our, our probably marquee achievement in the challenge committee uh, from the last three years that we started and when I first met with Bruce. Um, we talked about the, the Morgan Cup is the marquee event for um, yacht club team racing around the world. Royal Thames typically comes along with uh, 11 different teams from uh, the United States. And this year, um, we were fortunate enough to win. Uh, the team captain was Michael Menninger. But we had a great team. We had you know, a little bit of young and old. Uh, Craig Healy, you know, over 60, to Sammy Shea, who's like 19 or 20 years old. And, and it really was a great mix. And um, what really led to our success was the training here in San Francisco. And really, I think, for the challenge committee, one of the benchmarks, and I'll get into that, is our member participation. And uh, for two days, 
um, in late July. We had team racing here on San Francisco Bay. That's been the best team racing that was as good as the Morgan Cup. Um, and we had, you know, over 40 different members participate um, in those two days leading up to it and the, uh, and the other days. So one of the things that I focus on at the Challenge Committee is broadening uh, the reach in terms of involving more and more members to get out and race because we do actually have the best team racers in the world and our group of members who are, say, 25 to 35 um, we probably have the best group of members in the whole wide world. So it's an opportunity for us to leverage. Um, so why did we do the challenges? Ron made it sound like we kind of reach out to the other clubs. But the reality is um, there's been a lot of club on club challenges that kind of passed us by in the mid 2000s and then into the teens. And in particular, the New York Yacht Club um, runs a group of three team races, one for the Open, the Morgan. They run a Masters Regatta called the Him and Masters. And then they run the Grand Masters Regatta. And that's really the big event. But um, the club challenges really represent the best competition out there. I mean, most of these events, you come, uh, the boats are prepared. There's no d difference between the boats, the sails, etc. cetera. Um, the other reason, I think, for us as a club to be doing the challenges, we've challenged twice for the America's Cup. And what's happened now with the result of these challenges, we've developed a few other kind of club on club challenges, similar to the San Francisco Cup. But with Royal Yacht Squadron, who was here two years ago, we went there this year. Um, it's kind of focused on an under 30 crowd, and we've had you know, great opportunities to, to mix up with them. And at the same time, we had a, a challenge, I think it was two weeks ago, with Newport Harbor down at their club uh, celebrating Ken Gardner. And uh, that was a little different. It was you know, five married couples were competing. So uh, we're mixing it up with club after club, and, and, and really it's, it's an uh, opportunity to, to create history. Um, and this is the one, the third item here, opportunity to integrate the youth and the seasoned sailors. Um, again, we have a great group of uh, 25 to 35-year-old, and we have a lot of young kids who are sailing in the opties and really don't get the chance to race at the highest level and compete at the highest level that uh, we're doing, I think, on the team racing and the match racing. And, and the more opportunity we have to trickle in um, those youth with us older folks, I think it really creates an opportunity where we will develop lifelong sailors. And uh, Rich Jepson, who I'm involved with on U.S. Sailing, you know, that's one of the things that they've identified is mixing the ages is, is one of the best ways to uh, encourage lifelong sailors. And uh, we have a wealth of talent here at the club. Um, the other thing I talk, touch upon on the challenges, it's an opportunity for the best sailors to keep racing. If you've uh, raced at a high level in, in college and you don't own a boat, the club on club challenges is the best way to go race. And I think it's manifested by the fact, if you look at our membership, we have more members you know, under 30 who are competing around the world um, in these club on club challenges than our, than our counterparts. Um, the opportunity to invest in our teams, and this is one thing that I, I give a lot of credit to Bruce and Debbie for, because uh, one of the things that we hadn't had in the past, I'll call it is a little bit of parental supervision. And, um, you know, we'd go off and we'd do a challenge, and for some people it was really a reason to kind of enjoy themselves. And I think having a sponsor or a supporter, like in the case of Bruce uh, or Ray Lotto at the Global Team Race Challenge, we have someone to answer to. And I think for me as the captain, it's great to have someone to kind of lean on and have that parental presence. And uh, it, it definitely adds to the fact, and I think for the youth, they have a, they, it, it bridges that gap too. They're not just doing it for themselves and they realize that there's a bigger thing here and it is a club of you know, 2,500 members that they are actually representing. So um, I think it's a great opportunity for folks who can um, enjoy it and, and share it with, with the, these teams and I think you'll duly be impressed. And I think just ask Bruce and Debbie and you'll, they'll be our, my best salesman. Um, and then going on, I mean, for the club, you know, as we shown in the um, Morgan Cup, you know, we look like a team, we act like a team, we represent the club well. And um, again, I think, you know, for our members and, you know, one of the other things I think about is how do we add value to the membership and really we create a lot of bragging rights um, for our club. And, uh, you know, this year we, we were competed in more challenges than any other club other than New York Yacht Club. They, were, they represented us, out-represented us in a few cases in terms of total numbers, but in terms of quality, we outdid them. And the last thing, um, talking about the enhancing the value of the membership, I would say that's the opportunity to participate in our uh, practices and the opportunity to um, enjoy the bragging rights of 
victories such as these. So, you know, this, I think, uh, this year we won the San Francisco Perpetual. It was the first time since the 90s. But for me, the most exciting part, not just hanging out with Doug Holm and Steve Taff and Dennis Durgan, um, but it was this young guy in the glasses there, Dominic Bove, who's like 22 years old, and, you know, thinking that 30 years from now he can still be racing in this thing, and, and this will be his first time having done it. So um, it was a great mix of us, and you can tell we had a great time doing it. And my guess is San Diego is going to challenge us this year. When I down there, they just talked about it. Um, so how do we do it? And uh, we uh, started the committee with uh, Jim Kiriakis, uh, and the idea was to kind of blend, you know, some people from the ERC, the finance, the board members, and really re I'm at, we serve at the uh, call of the Commodore. So, so uh, explain for our, our viewers outside the club what ERC is. Oh, okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, the ERC is the Executive Race Committee. So, um, thank you, Tom. And then what we do is, is in the beginning of the year, Dick Watts has been on the committee and he's had the experience. We've reviewed the calendar. So, you know, in the, next, in the coming weeks, most of the clubs will put out their calendar and we'll identify the events that we'll want to compete in. And what the challenge committee does is we rank these regattas A, B, and C and determine an appropriate funding level. A regattas are typically full funded. So if you're a, uh, you know, an A level event and you're sending an A level team, the, you know, the hotel's paid for, the air travel's paid for, and, and the entry fee is also supported by the club. The next thing that happens is appointing a captain. And that's probably the most important in terms of the outcome of the success. The earlier the captain gets appointed, the earlier the team gets set up, and that leads to the best results. Um, identifying a team sponsor you know, for the A events, you know, we're going to target it within, the, within the committee you know, people who would like to be part of the team and actually travel with the team and help us in uh, executing, um, whether it's, you know, running the coach boat or, you know, funding it, whatever it is, we're looking for team sponsors. And the other item that happens, you've typically find when we did the team race practice, the two teams or the two full teams, which was six boats racing, it takes about 30 days to organize you know, it's kind of a day per person. So in, the, in that case, we probably had 30 different people. And to organize it, it takes at least 30 days of advance notice. Um, the picture you see here is our global team race challenge team. Um, we finished third, and it was a little bit disappointing. We were good enough to win. Um, we unfortunately didn't. Um, first place was a team from England, Royal Thames. And uh, we finished third with New York second. But there were 12 uh, teams from 10 different countries. And next year, uh, the race will be in England. And uh, it's 2v2, and, and we did a really well, nice job of representing the club and the team and uh, look forward to next year. So in terms of 2018, uh, Ron talked a lot about the results and, and uh, just to kind of by the numbers, uh, we competed in 19 different events. Uh, 12 of those are open, meaning no age required. Uh, we competed in seven master's events. And then we had, in terms of those 19 events, we had seven A events. Of those, we won two, which were the San Francisco Perpetual Cup and the Morgan. We got third in the Global Team Race Challenge, and then 11 Bs. Um, the budget for the club has for the, for the challenges um, is 80, was $82,000. Um, we're going to come in under that, closer to 70 than to 80. Um, and the one thing that was probably the biggest interest this year for me, and, and I think the measure of success, is the fact we generated some new sponsors, uh, people to travel with the team, and we generated $50,000 for that, and we're able to you know, raise that money through the foundations. So obviously relieves a burden on the membership, but uh, there's one member whose name is Peter Cunningham, who when I asked him, I was hoping to get him to be our leader in, in uh, Italy, and when he heard, you know, what our budget was and how big the club was, he's like, you know, he was astonished at how small it was. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, people have different views, but I think the reality is, you know, we, we touch a lot of members within the club and we hopefully bring a lot of value to the club, whether it's bragging rights or the opportunity to compete and participate with, with high level. Um, the participation, we had over 250 unique members participate in the training uh, and the organization of the events. And competed in England, and the one other event that happened this year, which I was involved with, um, and our club was involved with, and I think it's something we shall be proud of, is uh, the reigniting of and rejuvenating of the um, Lipton Cup here in the town. We had four trophies. Uh, we got 10 clubs to compete. Unfortunately, one of our boats broke the mass, so we only had nine clubs participating, but uh, nine Bay Area clubs competing, sending their best. One day it was a Masters, one day it was a women's team, and one day it was open. 
and uh, it was a big hit, and everyone's going to want to come back again next year. So um, that's something we as a club were really the, uh, the one to facilitate by allowing our J22s to be used. And here's our uh, women's team with plus Eric Gray uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the race. So the race was a race from here to Richmond uh, the first day on Friday. And then Saturday was um, open racing, course racing uh, in Richmond. And then on Sunday, the race was raced back from Richmond here to St. Francis, skippered by women's teams. <coughs> so looking at... Um, you know, 2019 and beyond, how do we improve and, and how can members help out? Um, I think the main thing really is, is really driving the junior involvement. I think uh, this has been something that we know that we're missing on, and we have an opportunity really to leverage the best, uh, you know, our membership and our youth and the best sailors in the world if we can get them racing with them, racing with us. Um, our staff, we can leverage the staff, the Brent Harrells and the Grahams, and, and, and Chase does a fabulous job with the boats, but uh, I think we can get a little bit more of the staff involved and be maybe perhaps part of their um, you know, bonus and how things are figured in terms of their overall pay, but um, leveraging our staff would help in terms of relieving. Compete in all women's regattas. We didn't show up for the Linda Elias this year. Um, <clears throat> Commodore, and uh, but but uh, as a group, I think we we can compete in women's regards. We have the great uh, strength of the women's team. Obviously, Nicole having won the women's match race nationals, and last year American Yacht Club had an event uh, team race where we placed second. Um, the other thing is you know moving out the practice time, choosing the captains earlier, and the one thing that's going to happen this year, um, we'll have the challenge committee in place in mid December in mid. By, by mid-November, where last year we were kind of late to the game and didn't really get started until after the election and all the other stuff. So that hopefully will not be an issue. And, um, you know, broadening the team support. And uh, the one thing that we could do here as a club I think that would help um, is have our own A event. We don't have an A event where today of the seven A events, you know, three of them were in New York um, at, at Newport, Rhode Island. Then there was one in San Diego and then one at Newport. And we as a club, if we had an A, a event, I think it would really help us, uh, you know, internally and also uh, continue to get invitations. And uh, this is a picture of the uh, team that went to the Royal Yacht Squadron. And the one thing I think that's unique about this is that team there, none of those folks participated in either the Morgan Cup or the Hinman Masters or... Um, only um, Dominic competed on the San Francisco Perpetual. So overall, again, speaks to our breadth and depth of talent. And uh, talking about the objective, so I've, I've become a real disciple of uh, John Doerr, who's uh, a member here, and he has developed uh, uh, what he calls OKR, uh, Objectives and Key Results. So um, I've set out with Paul in looking at 2019 and the objectives, and for each of these objectives, we've come up with some key results. But... Um, uh, for the team and for the club, you know, we'll have the committee formed before December. That looks to be on track. Podium, four of the seven A events. Um, we've got those A events, you know, identified. Um, probably the biggest one on the, on, in terms of the objective, in terms of the green between the ball and the pocket, the hardest, I think, for us to achieve will be having our team qualify for the Governor's Cup, a uh, junior team. It's a, it's a tough competition, and uh, we have some horsepower in terms of the match racing here internally, but it's going to take a lot of development of our juniors to get to that level. Um, more sponsors, I think, relieve the financial burden of, of those who've led, led the charge, and hopefully their leadership will, will bring others along, and I think uh, the experience that the uh, supporters have had should um, uh, make that easier. Get more people involved. Um, so our target is to get 300 unique inv members involved. That's everything from hosting people to running the races to actually training. Um, when I see inventory, our skills, and that really relates to um, our uh, skills specifically in terms of who's a bowman, who's a middleman, and, and go through our entire membership and know who's, who's available and who can compete and really you know, what level they are. Are they an A, B, where do they fit? Um, actively develop lifelong sailors. That again goes to the trickle down and ideal measure that we're going to, the number that we're going to focus on this year is getting 50 juniors out practicing and racing with us. And uh, our goal is to come in under budget. And uh, one event I think that everyone here in the club should be aware of, and um, I think we can do a really uh, great thing and, and with a presence, is at the 175th uh, annual regatta for New York Yacht Club uh, this coming summer. Um, there's only a few other clubs that are invited, and it's only those they have reciprocal privileges with, ourselves, Royal Yacht Squadron, 
um, Royal Thames, Costa Smeralda, and ourselves will be uh, invited to compete with them on the 175th. And um, there's going to be a team scoring. It's going to be a lot like the Royal Yacht Squadron's 200th uh, birthday. So um, this summer, if you know, it's something we're going to push on to get the club actively involved out there. They say it's going to be the largest dinner party ever in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, they're going to make a big deal about it. And uh, I think if we go there, you know, our 100th isn't too far away. So uh, for us, I think uh, it'd be great to get a, a good effort out there, and whether it's chartering boats, yeah. racing boats, and just as the St. Francis Yacht Club demonstrate our presence and, and uh, where, we, where we're going. Um, last weekend, we raced in the Lipton Cup. We had an epic team. And we didn't win. But uh, <laughs> this is a picture of us winning a few years back, and it eluded us this year. But we're coming back uh, next year. Uh, this year we had Paul Kerr who was sailing with us, and Chris Rabb was a skipper, and we just didn't quite get it done. We got fourth, but uh, we're coming back again next year. So with that, um, I'm going to close things off. And uh, Ron, I guess I'll invite you back. It's always a pleasure to get in front of uh, my friends and members, and uh, thanks for listening to the story and being part of it. Welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Our guest speaker today is Russ Silvestri, chairman of the St. Francis Yacht Club Challenge Committee. So Russ, tell me, what's the toughest part of your job on this committee? Um, the toughest part. I guess it's the, um, the preparation leading up and getting people to the practices and kind of pushing it along and uh, Getting people to accept responsibility, <laughs> I guess, is probably the toughest part. I mean, I, I, end up, I feel like I'm always willing to raise my hand and take responsibility. Um, but uh, I think the more and more we can, you know, I guess from my standpoint, I'd love this year not to have to be the one to assume the responsibility. And it'll be a little bit further ahead because of the timing. So uh, that, that would probably be the toughest part of the job. How many practice days? This uh, last year? I think we probably sailed, I don't know, 30 days or so. 30 practices. 30 days. practices, yeah. Out of how many regattas? Uh, well, we did 19 regattas. There are 19 challenge events that we competed in. Um, actually, 20 when you include the San Francisco Cup. So 20 challenge events that we competed in. Now, I'm going to keep asking questions until I see a hand up. And if you want to ask a question, hold up your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. And um, we'd love to have as many questions as possible from the audience. And we'll get questions through Julia from the web. So the, um, who, who do you respect as other yacht clubs? Who else has got a powerful challenge program? Well, New York, I mean, they really set the standard. I mean, what they're doing with the IC37, that's pretty epic. I mean, they're going to have 20 boats uh, this year, they hope. But, um, you know, they have a whole class of boats that they're developing for the members and, you know, racing with the amateurs. I mean, they, they do a great job. And then... Of course, San Diego this year, I mean, they kind of, they, they did a great job. They just won the Lipton Cup. They won the Resolute Cup. They, I think they were second or third to us at the Morgan. They have a lot of talent as well. Um, so they do a really good job. New York has a, a fair bit of talent. But uh, what they're doing uh, in terms of the organization of the events, they just keep getting better and better. So now you're, you competed in 19 events this last year. How many could we have competed in? Not that we want to, but 19 out of how many available? Uh, there are probably 40 or so. 40. Yeah. And um, talk about the uh, typical boats that you're using. Give us a range of equipment that you're provided at the venues. Uh, okay, so it runs the gamut from most of them are heavy and slow. <laughs> but there isn't too much light and, light and tippy. So uh, heavy and slows, the epic, uh, the biggest, the heaviest and slowest would be the Harbor 20 that we get compete in the Baldwin Cup at Newport. Um, you know, this is the marquee event for Newport Harbor Yacht Club. They clear out all the moorings. They get 12 different teams from around the world, and, and it's a first-class event. Um, at New York Yacht Club, we're always competing in the Sonar. Um, they have 24 boats, and, or maybe 20, I think it's 24 boats. And, you know, they're all evenly matched. I mean, it's 24 boats. It's, pr it's epic. I mean, the, you're, you're doing four flights of team racing, and you're rolling into it. And, you know, for the Morgan Cup, there's 12 different teams, and they get, you know, typically 140 races in over a three-day period. So they're, they're on the ball. They're working. Uh, St. Petersburg Yacht Club has some J70s. Um, so that's really the gamut of the boats. There's, um, the J-22s we have here really aren't as popular anywhere else, but, you know, they're, they're more of a Midwestern type of thing. But, uh, 
sonars is the most popular. <clears throat> How do you handle boat prep? You're going to arrive in a city. Give, me, give us the, uh, the weekend in the life of a challenge committee. When do you arrive? When does somebody handle boat prep, et cetera? So I, I'd say, you know, the one where you have the playbook for that's, that's been practiced, we almost have, we even have the shopping list uh, that we're going to buy for the team. So New York Yacht Club, take the red eye flight on Wednesday night, get there Thursday morning, get in the rental car, you know, two rental cars, everyone drives down there, um, you know, do the weigh in. Hopefully you can check into the house. Um, one thing we've done a really good job of, I think, at least uh, is having one house and one team. And that gives us a chance to kind of eat together, sleep together, just be together and, you know, talk through everything. And we're not in, you know, different hotel rooms or anything like that. And it really, it creates, makes it more, for a more fun experience, but I think it has produced better results. So then um, we're there Thursday. Thursday night, we typically eat in. And then, you know, Friday, we're off and racing. And, and for us, traveling, we're, first day, we're usually a little less because we're a little tired. But and by the weekend, we're kind of gaining momentum. Um, so that's... You know, it's kind of go do your business, you know, be at the boat by 8, and, you know, you're home at 5, 6. And, you know, when my wife comes, she, she tends to make dinner, so that's a little bit better. <laughs> we have to acknowledge Beth, who is just here. Where's, there is Beth, dear wife Beth. Couldn't do any of this without Beth. <clears throat> so the org chart inside the committee. So you're the chair of the committee. What are the different responsibilities under, uh, within the committee? Um... I, th I think it mostly it's sanity. Um, you know, it's is it the one thing I think when Dick Watts was on the committee and, and we probably put more focus on is do fewer events, but do those events we do do them well, um, as opposed to just kind of going and showing. And um, so the dynamics within the committee, it's I'd say that you know as chairman and, and the commoner, we would typically get together and kind of identify those things. Then I feel it's my job to carry the the flag to the committee and, and get their support for it. And hopefully they're asking great questions. I mean, Jason Holloway, who was on the committee a couple of years ago, you know, didn't have the experience of having done these challenge events, and he asked great questions. And I think that's the job of the uh, the fellow committee members is is to ask the questions and own the results, you know? So if we have bad results, everyone on the committee owns that. It's not like, oh, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't know or I didn't, wasn't involved. We typically have four, four meetings a year. Um, so we don't have month to month meetings, but we set it out pretty well, I think, in terms of what the plan is in the agenda. And, I, and one thing that's happened too for us, I think like Chicago Yacht Club, um, you know, they wanted to know what we did. And, you know, I was felt pretty free to share exactly what we do. I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's nice to win, but at the same time, it's better to have good competition. <laughs> exactly. They'll be watching yeah. here. Um, talk about weather uh, conditions and how you deal with weather in any given market. Do you have a weather briefing? Do you hunt for somebody to give you? Uh, I mean, we do the pretty standard, you know, the eye wind surf, wind alert. I mean, that's kind of what we live on and, and use, so it's nothing too, too unique. Um, it, it, usually the races are so short it doesn't matter. What are the, what are the, give us a format of typical races, length of time, et cetera. Uh, typical, you know, team races are, you know, less than 20 minutes. And here last week at the Lipton Cup, I think the races were like 30 minutes. So. And how many in a regatta? Uh, Lipton Cup last week, there were 12. So, so lots of short 20-ish minute races. Yep. yep. Uh, what about local knowledge? How do you deal with local knowledge in the different venues you go to? I mean, we've been going there now enough that we, we be, I would say, become locals in some ways. <laughs> so, you know, it's a pretty clear playbook, whether it's in San Diego or if it's in Newport, what the tide's doing and the wind's doing. Um, but, you know, it still comes down to the race and the start and get going. Julia, you, Julia, you got a question from the web. Uh, yes, I have one comment from Nadine Fancic, who is sitting in the United Club in Denver, oh. who says... Thanks uh, to the, her fellow committee members for this year, for your in input and serving on the committee. Most of all, congrats to all the sailors. And then we have a more complicated question, which is, San Francisco Cup 2019 is a logical stepping stone toward Governor's Cup for slightly older kids. How soon can we talk about the logistics of developing two match race teams out of high school? kids who were racing C420s last weekend. That will be a David Perry match, rare clinic again next spring, but by then it's too late to start. Start tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, here, you know, we have the J22s, right? And, and uh, you know, we have talent with Nicole and we have, you know, we have a fair bit of talent that can go match race. So I think if, if the um, club and the juniors, you know, 
pick the people and get the boats. There's people who are willing to you know come down and 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 sail. I think you know in the winter time you just have to be sensitive of the wind. That's the main thing. But tomorrow sounds like a good time to start. <laughs> If we, nobody says we would, but if we doubled the budget, what could we do that we don't yet do? Um, so last year when we looked at the budget, you know, it was like $150,000 <laughs> was going to do all the things we wanted to do. This last year we would have done the event at Costa Smeralda that we didn't do. Um, I think, you know, with Paul on the committee, um, you know, he's you know, keen that, you know, that if we're going to be the, one of the greatest yacht clubs in the world, we have to you know, be willing to travel and compete against the best yacht clubs in the world. And not doing the Costa Smeralda event was one that we definitely would have done last year. Um, but, you know, so $150,000, I think, really is kind of the number that gets us to do all the A events and, you know, the B events where we typically are funding the entry fee and then the sailors are funding their travel and stay. So what's the role? Talk a little bit about the role of a sponsor. So um, the role of the sponsor really is, um, I'd say, to own the event, own the team. I, I call it the team owner. You know, I think he owns the team and he owns the result. And, you know, he's involved in picking the, the, the personnel, but he's involved in talking to the captain. And I think having been the captain and having the sponsor, it's someone you can confide in, ask questions to, um, look to for support. And when the people on the crew may not be doing exactly what you want them to be doing, he can ask them to do what they should be doing. So that, that's one of the benefits. Um, I, but I think, you know, the financial, and then when we're practicing and they show up and they come down and they demonstrate an actual real interest in how we're doing. And um, I think, you know, the, the sailors all want to hear their story. Um, you know, hearing Bruce's story about how he became a developer, I think, you know, the, the young, the, kids out of college liked hearing that story and, and that's something they'll remember and they appreciate and you know I, I look forward to getting Ray Lotto down there or, you know if it were uh, whoever it might be you know it, you know telling us Lois Limbach tell me about what's going on in the world of patent what was it like to be married to a patent attorney forever I don't know but it, and, you she, know, was, and she was also a patent attorney. It, well there you right. go yeah. so you know Lois has a lot to add and I think so many people want to hear what Lois has to say so <laughs> um, just seeing her back there and, and knowing that she comes to the club. I think all of us have a great story to tell, and, and the more and more that our members hear those stories, it just, you know, it goes up and down the, uh, the grapevine um, in terms of youth to senior. A question from Randy Heck. Is the St. Francis Yacht Club just coming up the, the curve as far as these Yacht Club challenges, or is there a, a, a sea change going on in how competition is being organized and is this driven by team, the team racing out of high school and college, or is it being driven by something else? Uh, that's a great question. I think um, it's, it's definitely more of a sea change. I think uh, clubs obviously see that by the fact that they're buying fleets. Um, you know, with New York being the biggest now, owning tw they took risk on $2,300,000 boats. And so they, they're making a big bet that that's where the world's going and that, you know, fair competition, good competition amongst members. And um, so I think, and then from the team racing side, I think for the kids coming out of college, and I remember it when I did team racing, it's a great experience. And it allows levels to be mixed within a team, where in match racing, if someone's better than the other person, they're going to win 95% of the time. If you have a, a team race team with two good people, one less skilled, you know, that team can still win you know, 60% of the time. So I think it allows for more people to participate and compete at a high level in the team racing. Um, and I think there is a sea change just because it's simple. Um, you show and you go. And there's not a lot of boat maintenance and travel and all the other stuff. Um, so, yeah, and it's competitive. That's what I think, you know, people like. I mean, you, just one quick thing. I mean, Long Beach Yacht Club, you look at what they've done with the Catalina 37. I mean, they get, you know, typically 300 people to a, a race on a Wednesday night to come down there and, on a Catalina 37, which is, you know, probably 30-year-old boat and, uh, you know, fully depreciated. And, you know, they use it for Congressional Cup, et cetera. And it just brings a lot of value to the members. So we have the 22s, J-22s. Uh, would you think we should expand the J-22 fleet or flip to the 70s or a newer class? Um, I don't I think expanding, since we already got 10 of them, if we expanded it, it would probably solve a lot of, it, a lot of problems. I think the J-22s teach you a little bit more about, you know, boat work, or not boat work, but crew handling than does the J-70. Um, and it's better, you know, symmetrical spinnakers are a lot easier to match race or better for match racing, I think, than the A-sails. So... 
Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think you know, we can still go race the J22 in the World Championships, and so it, it, it's good enough. It doesn't. That is not the problem. What are the classes that other clubs are buying for such purposes? Their fleet, local fleet. Uh, well, the sonar has kind of been, I guess, kind of out downsized by the J70. So there's a fair number of those available for sale, and that's probably the club boat. They're pretty easy to sail. And then the next boat would probably be the J70 um, in terms of what's used around the country. Uh, and then the J22 would be right up there. How can the uh, challenge committee um, affect, best affect the culture of the whole club? What uh, could you do to affect the culture? Culture. Um, I, I mean, I think it's just people willing to put themselves out there. You know, I think, uh, you know, people who... You know, you got to, I mean, like Walt Spivak, right? Walt had never team raced before. He's been a laser sailor. He gets out there. Dude, he wasn't pretty when he first got out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you got to be willing to kind of put yourself out there and, you know, take some pain and you learn the, learn the road. So it, it's not an easy game to play, especially on the team racing. And, you know, you got to be willing to put yourself out there. I think with that, there you'll be embraced by those who are there because we always need bodies. Um, so I think in terms of the culture, um, just doing more of it. I think when uh, you know, it's, uh, I think incumbent upon us in the challenge committee to make sure that the message is out there in terms of when we are practicing um, and what we are doing. And you know, when we are doing an A level practice, you know, realize that maybe the C C guy is not going to be on the boat. But if we're doing a B and an A mix up, then you know, there may be a spot for you. So what are the trifecta of big challenge events? If you were to say the top three events, what would they be for us? Uh, I'd say, well... If not that we just do, but we could do. And, and that we do. do. I'd say there's nothing now that we're not doing. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's a Sawanica match race, but eh, not really. I mean, so the ones I would say of the club on club that, you know, if you ask 10 other clubs that compete, what are their top three? My guess is it would be the Morgan, the Lipton, the U.S. Yacht Club, the the challenge that New York has, of which they only allow one other U.S. Com team to compete. Um, the, uh, so I mentioned Lipton, Baldwin, uh, Baldwin, Morgan um, would be kind of the three, and then the New York Yacht Club's uh, um, challenge that the international regatta they have would probably be, you know, that happens every other year, which is the Resolute Cup in off years. So what about European events or Asian events? Are they coming along? What's, what, yeah, what so that, that is actually, there's a big push there um, with the clubs, and uh, it's all in J70s. And, and we as a country, United States, haven't really competed in that. I got invited to go do it a couple of years ago, and I didn't do it. But um, it's a really big thing going on in, in Europe, this, the Sailors League. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think we'll make our way there, but it's J70s and it's fleet racing. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different. Yes, Dick. Dick Watts. Yeah, Russ, do any of the big events that you go to have corporate event sponsors? So there might be some extra money available if we were to think about putting one on here, or is that not on the horizon? Uh, the only one I'd say that has a corporate event sponsor is New York Yacht Club. I think last year it was Porsche, and I don't know who it was this year. They had someone. AIG was this year's sponsor, so they're the one that you know seems to be the most obvious corporate sponsor. Baldwin Cup has JP. I mean, yeah, they they do actually think about. It. I mean, JP Morgan I think probably invests somewhere between thirty and fifty thousand dollars, and they get their folks, you know, customers down there, and they have a tech lunch and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, those two for sure. Lipton had a sponsor too this year, but I don't think it's the order of magnitude that Baldwin is, or New York Yacht Clubs. So if a, if a person becomes a member of the committee, becomes a sailing member in your committee, how does that affect or benefit the rest of their sailing experience? What do they get out of doing this that they might not get in the rest of their sailing activities? Uh, I guess they got to pick and choose who's on the team. <laughs> I mean, or really, the, what, the way it breaks down is the, ca the, the um, challenge committee picks the captain, and then it's the captain's, captain owns the budget, captain owns the team, and um, that's, where, that's where it lives. Give us a typical captain's budget for an event. Well, it depends what it is. Um, you know, the most expensive event we do is probably is the Morgan Cup, which is, you know, 12 people traveling to Newport, Rhode Island. It includes a house. It includes plane flights. It includes the entry fee. And it's roughly a $20,000 ticket. Um, you know, this last weekend, the Lipton Cup was an $8,000 entry fee. It's local in terms of the flights. And so it's probably a $15,000 ticket. How many new sponsors did you add this last year? Uh, 
really we added three. Um, we had a few folks step up for the uh, the Royal Thames team, um, but never you know first time. I mean, we've really been fortunate with Bruce and Debbie were the first people to kind of put the toe in the water, and you know now they're starting to attract more fish. <laughs> So what's happening with team racing in the world? Is it, is it growing? Is it peaked? Is it, what's no, happening with it? It's continuing to grow. I think in, in Europe in particular, the 2v2 format is very popular. Um, again, it, it's a cost issue. You can show up with you know, two, people on a t a two, 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 team, two boats on a team, and you know, you're looking at six people traveling. And with the J70 in particular in Europe, um, you know, it, they're, they're quite prevalent. So, you know, at the, at the world, the global team race challenge this year, I mean, uh, England was significantly better. You know, the three teams that were uh, top, us, New York, and, and England, were better than the rest. Italy was probably third, and then Germany was probably fourth, and, you know, Australia was kind of down the road. Um, but, you know, they were the best of the best of the, for their countries. And what's happening with Asian yachting? I mean, are they coming up this, the curve? What's happening with China? Japan was at the team, Global Team Race Challenge. I think they got last. Or maybe they didn't get last, but they got eighth or something. They were, China? Don't see them. So if you live with the sort of life cycle of a sailor, uh, starting as a kid, you know, growing uh, old in the yacht club and all that sort of stuff, how does the challenge fit? Talking about yourself now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, how, does it, how does the challenge committee... Um, you know, um, fit into the experience that a, that a person has inside a yacht club? Yeah. I, I, for me, I think we have a lot of members who have the capability to give, and I think it's an opportunity for them to demonstrate generosity and selflessness and um, be part of the team and own it. I think it's a great, it's a great feeling of when we have, you know, it's like the days of the Scarlet O'Hara and the great fun and the bullfrog and when they're big boats, and now you don't have to own the boat, but you, you, know, you get to have the team. And the team is, you know, young, you know, young guys out of guys and gals out of college who have a great spirit and, you know, want to represent the club well. And it, and it's it's an enjoyable thing to be around. I mean, it's a good group of people. So, to you know, for the for that type of person, I think it's it enables us to do more and do it better. Of which, you know, in the end of the day, I, everyone in the club is going to have the chance to have that bragging right in terms of whether or not we win the San Francisco Cup, we win the Women's Match Race Championship, whatever it is. It just demonstrates that when we do things, we do it right. So women on the teams, what's the usual percentage of women? What, how do you feel about women on the teams? Not how do you feel about it? I mean, how are they participating? Um, well, in the, the case of the Royal Yacht Squadron, I think there are five, girl, five girls and four guys. So um, it doesn't matter. I mean, last year we were the only, we, we did something in the Lipton Cup. We sent an all women's team um, to the regatta. So. You know, we as a club, St. Francis is definitely, um, well, I don't say, say open-minded, but definitely pushing that initiative. And it's, you know, led by Nicole in terms of what she does with the, you know, our sailing programs. And we have talent and we have a chance to use it. And uh, I, it's a great, it's a, it's a treasure that's just sitting there to be opened. So what's happening in the, in the Great Lakes? Um, you know, is it just Chicago? What other clubs are available up there to be part of <coughs> challenge activities? So Chicago's doing a really pretty good job. I don't know. They probably have, what, 12 sonars? Yeah, I think they have 12 sonars. They, in the Great Lakes, are also adopting the IC37, which is the New York Yacht Club's boat for their challenges, the Canada's Cup. Um, so they're... They definitely don't have the depth and breadth that, that we have here, but they are making a better effort of it. They're still, you know, they're not on the same level as the California clubs. I mean, if you look at the clubs in terms of who we compete against, New York, Newport Harbor, San Diego, you know, ourselves are probably, you know, a chunk ahead of the next guys. Southern Yacht Club would be right in there too. Is there an effort to have... Um, the, the Masters, we all remember racing the Masters regatta. Is there going to be challenges that are age-specific that you can see coming down the pike? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, you know, you have the International Masters in San Diego. You have the Ma Grand Masters team racing. So definitely, um, yeah. Essentially, what about the um, what's happening in Treasure Island? Is there any way we can integrate um, fast with our challenge activity on the Yacht Club? I haven't really thought about that, I'll be honest with you. Um, so I don't, I don't know the answer. I think for us as a club, I think we we're really trying to draw from the resources within the club and the members. And, you know, I think when I'm thinking about it, it's like how do we add value to the members and their experience? Um, so I haven't really thought about the fast 
idea. So if you were to measure the benefits of the committee for the club, uh, talk about what the club gets. It's, it's clearly an exciting event. What does the club get out of, the, of, that, of it? Well, I think in some of the cases we get to host the trophy, right? So if we win the San Francisco Cup, it's, you know, winner takes it. So, you know, next year, San Diego, if they want to come challenge us, they have to show up with their boat and they have to, you know, come compete against us. So for that, it's, you know, ownership of the, of the result and, you know, future competition. I think, you know, there's pride in ownership, the fact that we did the job well, um, and that should be, you know, enjoyed by all the members of the club um, in terms of what we represent. I think it also fosters, you know, in the case of Dominic Bove, it gives him, you know, something to look forward to for the next 30 years. And when we have this last weekend, we had a, um, the Lipton Cup guy, a team, a guy who'd never really raced it at that level before, and he'll remember it, and he'll be a, uh, a stakeholder and a, call it a shareholder, and someone to, you know, carry the ball forward for the club. Um, and I think, you know, when we, one of the things actually we try and focus on in the team racing is in the teams is that new people are always involved. Like in this year's Lipton Cup, uh, four of the crew had never raced before in the event. If you look at the Morgan Cup, it's usually 25 to 40 percent of the crew. It's their first time doing it. So each time we do an event, that's one of the benchmarks that we look at is, you know, how many people are new uh, to the event. Bruce has a question. Uh, yes, actually, uh, more of a statement, uh, what it's like to be a sponsor. Uh, I actually left, and, but I was thinking I really did want to say this for all those that are maybe on the podcast and they're, they're listening uh, out there in Denver airports or wherever, that it is a, f a far more rewarding experience than anyone can ever imagine. And a couple of things that were said here um, that I wanted to relate to, uh, one was uh, how interested uh, these young men and women are in their sponsors' life, their world, how they did what they did, how they got their, their successes and failures. And, and uh, Russ was alluding to that, and it was two and a half years ago we were sitting over at that table with the team after coming off the water. And they were just glued into myself, uh, the, their sponsor, in – because see, I look at these young men and women, they're like startup companies. They're just at the beginning of, of really looking at how to grow their careers and sailing is part of what their character is, but it's their life that they're going forward in. And it meant so much to them and they were listening to my long journey and how I did what I did and again, the successes and failures. And they, you become a family, and they, you, you get glued in on that, and you really get a bonding and a relationship. And so when you get back um, to Morgan Cup or wherever you are, and also the reference was made to being the, the grown-up in the room or whatever, they have another reason of why they want to succeed. They Obviously for themselves and the love of the sport, obviously for their club, but they also want to succeed for their sponsor. They... They really look at them, if you're going to believe in me and put your money where your mouth is and help me work on this team to make this dream come true, i got to deliver for you. So it's a great relationship uh, uh, for me, the right place, and for Debbie, the right place at the right time in our lives, and for them to have that relationship uh, going forward. So it's extraordinarily re rewarding, and anybody that listens to this that – consider stepping into the role that Debbie and I have stepped into and will continue in the future, I would encourage you to do so. It's very rewarding. Wonderful, Bruce. <laughs> so the whole challenge experience, I think there's a question over here too. The whole challenge experience, Russ, can you talk a little bit about going away as a team to go for this quest? You know, you're going to go off as a team to win this event some four-away city? Yeah, I think what, what Bruce said when he said family, that was the word that really resonated with me. And I think that is really what it ends up being is, you know, we all get there at the red eye together and we get on the plane together and we drive, <clears throat> drive together. It's just, you know, it's a long, it's, it's a journey, right? You know, from here to there and, you know, to the race. And it's a little bit of pedal to the metal consistently uh, to deliver the results and, and be competitive. I mean, we're a little bit behind the, you know, because we're so far away from the New York folks, but... Um, and the East Coast guys, but uh, that part of the journey, I think, you know, we all see each other at the airport and everyone kind of greets each other with a smile. And, uh, you know, 
if we don't win, you know, sometimes you know, when we all leave, we aren't smiling as much and hugging each other and so excited to see each other uh, when we first saw them. But, you know, the next time we see each other, it's always that way. And uh, I know when we, when we start uh, the Baldwin training last year, was a, last year was a disappointment for us. And I think when we get ready for that this year, you know, that will be forgotten. And, you know, the next quest will be uh, front, and, front and center. And I think, you know, that will be an era of, you know, the family getting back together. Julia. Uh, just, a, the web. just a couple comments. One from uh, from uh, Peter McDonald. Where did it, where did it go? Uh, who says, "Great job, Russ. Great clubs are represented at these events." Peter McDonald from Newport Harbor. Yeah, Peter McDonald from New Newport Harbor. Um, and Alex Kent says, in, in appreciation of sponsors, uh, that's cool that one could rally sponsors which who would pay for participation in major traveling regattas. That's, he thinks that's exciting. So. Yeah, definitely it is, and it, and it helps. And, and I, I think they, they, get a good, they get a good bang for their buck. <laughs> <clears throat> Talk a little bit about the whole mentoring experience. So you're away, you're at a faraway club. You guys have a team dinner, have team meetings for the course of a couple of days. Younger guys who are just in the sport, they get a chance to be around other sailors in this new setting. Talk a little bit about what you've seen there. Well, I th I'd have to say this last weekend at the um, Lipton Cup. I mean, we got you know Sailing World Hall or Sailing Hall of Fame, you know Paul Kayard on our boat, and we got a kid named Jacob Hugh who's from Singapore, and you know he came to Berkeley. It was his first time in the United States, and so he's you know learned sailing in Singapore, but here he is racing with Paul Kayard, you know who's raced the America's Cup whatever six different times, won the round the world race, and you know he's on the crew, <laughs> and so I think. That's a great experience that the, that he'll never forget, and I think he's grateful for it. And you know, it, it it just goes through the mentoring. And I think you know Ben Lesden was the same way on the bout. I mean, as a crew, we performed well, um, and I think you know having the presence of Paul there um, was great. And I think you know we can, he'll commit to something like that. he sees the value in it and the experience. And I think you know if we can get guys like Kostecki and Morgan Larson to also you know, come and step up and lead those kind of efforts in the team racing, match racing events um, with members who may not have experienced their, that level of sailing before. Um, it's just something that we have as a club to offer that no, real, no other club really can. So when I was a little kid in the club, I remember sailing with Denny Jordan and you know Dean Morrison and these guys, and we'd go out in these big ocean races. Sometimes they'd be overnight ocean races. And I loved the idea that I could hang out with these guys afterwards when they'd have drinks, even smoke cigars and stuff like that. And I was a kid, but I got so much out of hanging out with him. And part of what you're creating and recreating here is so close to the essence of the Yacht Club. I want to say, um, you know, it's a uh, great to have you as a speaker, Russ, and congratulations for the incredibly good job you're doing with our challenge committee. So our guest today, Russ Silvestri, chairman of the St. Francis Yacht Club Challenge Committee. Good on you, mate. You. And with that, meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>